right, our next speaker is uh, Dylan Festa. He's going to talk about uh, analog memories in a balanced rate-based network of EI neurons. OK, thanks. Uh, so I will start by flashing some of the keywords of this presentation. I will show a novel use of robust control theory um, to embed uh, associative uh, memories in a high number in a recurrent neural network under biological constraints. OK, uh, so I start by defining uh, auto-associative memory. Um, it is the um, capacity to reconstruct a previously stored item, starting from a noisy or partial representation of it. So on the left uh, here, uh, you see uh, a partial image that was previously memorized uh, by, our, by a system. If the system is able to perform auto-association, it will uh, reconstruct it in its original form. Uh, and of course, for us human, this is a daily task. Um, so for example, we can recognize words in a noisy environment. We can uh, spot friends uh, from a long distance. And I'm sure that some of you uh, were able to recognize uh, uh, Einstein in this uh, popular picture over here. So what happened in, uh, in uh, your brain is actually uh, analogous to, to what you saw uh, represented here. Uh, okay. Uh, the question is therefore, how can brains, that is uh, neural circuits, perform these kind of tasks? Uh, and to answer to it, uh, basically what we did is uh, building a system that addresses some of the key features uh, that uh, we expect to find in these kind of systems. Um, okay. So the first feature uh, that is uh, of our interest is the capacity of robust recall that you saw represented in, uh, in this uh, short animation. Um, then the second computational feature is the presence of multiple memories within the same system. Okay. Uh, then, third, uh, neurons are not binary units. Uh, they express the information through a spiking rate. Therefore, we want memories to be analog. Okay, so to give a more practical example, imagine that a neuron is a coding for the grayscale value of the, the little pixel that you saw there in a red color. Okay, we want this neuron to express for each memory state a distinct uh, rate. Okay. We now move to biological um, features uh, that uh, are observed experimentally in uh, real neurons. So one thing is that neurons are uh, uh, either only excitatory or only inhibitory in their inputs. Uh, this is known as the Dale's law. Um, and basically means that the population are separated uh, between excitation and inhibition. Additionally, neurons are recurrently connected uh, and the memories are stored in the weights uh, in the connection between neurons. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, the dynamical regime is balanced state. So this means that neurons have a very high excitatory and a very high inhibitory input and they're driven by the uh, net difference between the two, okay? And this is uh, used to explain the, um, the regime in, in which neurons are spiking in, uh, in vivo. Okay, uh, so there are many models that uh, study auto-associative memories, um, starting from the, pen, uh, from the seminal work uh, by John Offield, uh, who will uh, later speak at this uh, same conference. Uh, however, all these models cannot address all the, this feature in a unitary way, okay? Uh, so what we did is uh, we addressed this problem with a slightly different approach uh, than uh, usually um, used uh, for this system. So our approach is uh, top-down. That is, we start with an algorithm uh, that ensures uh, the capacity of embedding uh, multiple memories in an uh, analog scale. Okay? Uh, then we impose uh, a system dynamics uh, and a set of memories. And uh, the interplay of the tree determines the synaptic weights. Okay, um, so basically the, the robustness and the presence of analog memories are um, granted by the optimal, per, op, uh, the optimal algorithm uh, used, whereas the choice of the dynamics and of the, of the parameters on which we optimize um, determines the, the, uh, the fact that the biological constraints are uh, respected. Okay, um, now moving on, uh, oh yeah, I will describe first the, the dynamics, the memories, and then I will move on to the um, uh, algorithm that we use. So dynamics is a, a recurrent neural network. Um, so uh, neurons um, are uh, described by uh, internal voltage, V. There is a leak term, there is an external input that is a constant, and then we have a recurrent term over here that contains the presynaptic weights and the presynaptic rates. Okay, and the rates are a nonlinear function of the, um, of the voltages. And you see here the, the gain function, which is a threshold quadratic function. Okay. So you should notice here uh, that um, this function has no saturation. Okay, this means that uh, in principle the rate of the neuron can go up to infinity. Uh, but our point is that the stability in our system is uh, not achieved uh, by limiting the, the single units, uh, but is rather uh, the product of um, uh, network interactions. Okay. Uh, importantly, we also parameterize the weights as follow. Uh, this converts an uh, uh, a constrained optimization problem on the weights to an unconstrained optimization problem on uh, the beta parameters. 
uh, why it is uh, constrained, because the weights have to respect Dell's law, that is, uh, they should express two uh, different signs, uh, uh, ex excitatory part, so th that's the weight matrix that you see over here, um, is divided in uh, one positive part that is excitatory and one inhibitory part corresponding to the inhibitory population. Okay, uh, this separation in um, populations uh, is, also, is also important for the um, second uh, basic ingredient, that is the memories. In fact, neurons have different roles. Uh, so this is an intuition that we had. Uh, basically, uh, excitatory neurons carry the information and encode the memories, uh, whereas inhibitory neurons are used as auxiliary variables to stabilize the system. Okay, so now limiting ourselves to the excitatory population, uh, we sampled uh, neurons, uh, memories, sorry, uh, from a log normal distribution that you see over here. And now uh, what you see are examples of different memory patterns that we sampled from the distribution. And the memories are completely arbitrary. Uh, therefore, we added uh, another state uh, in which all the neurons fire at their average frequency. And this corresponds to no memory being recalled as a baseline state. Okay, now what we want is that all the patterns that you see over here are embedded and are robustly stable in our system. Uh, what I mean by that, I will show that with an example. Uh, so now imagine that our network is only made of two neurons. Okay, now two memories uh, are two different points in the phase space described by the two rates of the neurons. So uh, what we mean by recall, uh, if we start our system uh, close in the vicinity of one of the neurons, we want to converge, um, sorry, in near one of the memories, we want to converge to it, okay? If we start closer to the second memory, we want our system dynamics to converge to the second memory, not on the first. So in other words, in our system, uh, the memories are um, stable uh, local fixed point attractors, okay? Uh, the problem is therefore how to embed a large number of fixed point attractors in a system like the one I described before. Uh, and that's where we exploit a recent uh, advance in our op optimal um, uh, control theory, okay? Um, and basically our approach, our algorithm relies only on the necessary and sufficient condition of stable fixed point in a system. The first condition is that uh, the velocity at the points of interest is zero, so velocity at tractor zero. And the second condition is that when we perturb our system, uh, the dynamics goes back uh, to the stable points, okay? So um, now, in the vicinity of one of the memories, we can linearize the system and describe it, uh, basically by a first term, it is zero uh, given to the first condition. The second term is, uh, contains the Jacobian of the system. And now the problem becomes to stabilize the linear dynamics uh, given by the Jacobian matrix for each of the different memories, okay? And this can be a bit challenging because of course we want several memories within the same system. Okay, so what we did. Um, so we start with a random matrix that you see over here with the separation between excitation and inhibition. From here we uh, obtain a Jacobian matrix. Okay, and then we study the values of it um, to observe its stability. And for this example, we see that there is a positive uh, eigenvalue, uh, therefore one unstable direction. Okay, uh, this uh, real part is known an, uh, as a spectral abscissa. It determines the stability of the system and is a non-smooth uh, and non-convex quantity. So it's very hard to optimize upon it. Uh, here you see, uh, for example, what happens if we try to uh, smoothly change one of the parameters of J. So the, the spectral abscissa, that is the real part of the highest eigenvalue, uh, creates uh, cusps uh, it is very irregular, okay? And moreover, it does not give guarantees for transient behaviors. Um, however, there is a new quantity uh, called the uh, smooth spectral abscissa that has been recently introduced by, by Van der Liebt, uh, in 2009. It's an upper bound of the spectral abscissa and is uh, both smooth and uh, differentiable. So uh, it has a smoothness parameter uh, epsilon. When this parameter is zero, the two quantities are coincident. Uh, and now you will see over there what happens when we increase epsilon. Uh, so uh, when we increase it, basically we obtain a, an upper bound and a smoothing of the spectral abscissa. Uh, and of course, uh, there is a trade-off in the, how big is epsilon and how well uh, we can capture the behavior of the spectral abscissa. Okay, so now that we have a, a smooth function, we can uh, perform an op optimization upon it, a uh, gradient descent. And we do this um, at the same time for all the memories that we want to embed, uh, while also keeping the condition of zero velocity at the memory point. Okay, uh, so you will see now uh, what happens uh, when we perform this al algorithm on the uh, connection matrix over there. So in a few steps, uh, the positive eigenvalue becomes in fact negative, uh, but then if we uh, go on uh, with the algorithm, um, so with the procedure, we actually gain a, a big margin of stability in the eigenvalues. Uh, and this uh, determines a new uh, weight matrix that you see over there, uh, where there is still separation between excitation and inhibition due to the, our choice of uh, parameters. Uh, okay, 
So now to sum up, uh, the cost function that we used uh, as this uh, structure, uh, so the first um, uh, parameter on which we optimize are the weights, uh, but respecting Dell's law, so that's, what, that's why uh, they are reparameterized. We have a second term uh, that are the rates of the auxiliary neurons, that is the inhibitory uh, uh, units. Okay, and now on the right hand side, we have a summation over all the memories, okay, because all the, they have all to be optimized at the same time. Uh, we have a stability term, that is the smooth spectral abscissa. Uh, we have a, a term that gives the um, uh, zero velocity at the attractors, and a regularization term that limits uh, the growth of the weights. And you should notice that this is just, a, this is the cost function that we used. It does not have any a term related to um, balanced state. Uh, so it, actually that, that balanced state will arise naturally uh, just for the condition of having robust stable points uh, in a system. Um, okay. Now uh, moving on with the, the results. So the example that you saw at the beginning actually is uh, made by a system like ours in which instead of using uh, uh, log norm uh, memories we use the uh, grayscale Im images. But um, so, and there's a toy model with only three memories. So this is the first, this is the second memory. And then you will see a baseline state. So if we just eject random noise, all the neurons will go to the average firing rate. Uh, but the important bit here is that uh, the, the grayscale is exactly the rate of the neuron. So we are not using any filtering uh, to, to make the, the image, basically. Um, but that's the, the whole excisory population as it is uh, in terms of rate. OK. Uh, now, um, what we did now is uh, train 30 memories in a system of 100 excitory and 50 inhibitory neurons. Okay, and now we measure the performance against an ideal observer. Uh, so starting with the ideal observer, um, so basically um, what happens, we queue the system with a noisy version of the attractor that we want to recall. Okay. The, this, uh, the noise is expressed in terms of distance. Uh, distance is one for uh, two um, vectors that are randomly sampled for, from the distribution. Okay. So the ideal observer makes mistakes. Uh, so the ideal observer, sorry, uh, has a perfect knowledge of all, all the attractor. So has a perfect storage of the memories and alway, always speaks the memory that is closer to the initial queue. So the errors of the ideal observer only arise because behind some noise, uh, basically the, the queue becomes similar to a different memory than the intended one. Okay. Uh, and now this is instead by comparison the performance on our network. Uh, that is of course uh, comparable uh, with that of the ideal observer. Okay, the question now is what are the, the features that enable this kind of um, uh, recall capacity and robustness? Uh, so first of all, we look at the weight distributions uh, of our optimized network, and we see that the weights are uh, highly picked at zero, uh, but have long tails. Uh, and this can be uh, compared uh, with experimental data, and we see a high qualitatively uh, resemblance between the two. <coughs> okay. Um, additionally, we know that um, neurons are sparsely connected, uh, so here we have uh, simply the, the cumulative probability, and what we did is uh, we zeroed all the weights below 0 0.01. So uh, roughly half of the weights of the matrix has been um, erased, basically, and cut away, and then we measured again the performance of the system. And uh, remarkably, uh, our system is still able to perform auto-associative tasks. So even if, when half of the weights are cut, uh, we still have uh, record capacities. We lose some uh, precision in this and some performance, uh, but still um, it is good. Okay. Uh, and finally, um, so the other result is balanced state. So the presence of very high weights suggests uh, that uh, the state can be balanced. So what we do is that, um, um, so this is for a single neuron, uh, we plot the excitory input versus inhibitory input uh, during our recall state. Okay, so the color is the neuron. We have 30 dot points because we have 30 memories in our system. Okay, and as you see, uh, basically the excitation, uh, the points uh, lie on the identity line, me meaning that excitatory input and inhibitory input are uh, very high because they're, they're far from the origin, but still balance each other. And this happens also for other neurons uh, over here, and here you see the whole population. Uh, so basically most of the neurons are uh, on the line. Okay. And this is by comparison what is observed in a real neuron in terms of uh, contact conductances. So uh, again, um, there is a very high uh, excitation inhibition and, uh, for neurons uh, when they are in uh, stable uh, states. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, we added a noise term on the currents. Uh, so uh, basically, we added a term to the dynamics over there that is a Gaussian noise um, corresponding to uh, a noisy term on the input currents. So now the system is constantly bombarded by noise. So up to now it was simply uh, deterministic dynamics. Now we inserted a noise term. And we measured what happens in time in terms of distance uh, from the uh, targeted uh, memory. 
Okay, uh, so if we start close to one memory, uh, we see big oscillations, but still the system is uh, close to the desired memory. And by comparison, the distances from all other memories, memories are uh, much higher. So uh, this means that even when bombarded by noise, uh, our system is uh, capable of performing uh, recall tasks. Okay. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we introduced here an optimi optimization approach that uh, achieves high capacity memory uh, under realistic biological constraints. Uh, we had some features that we wanted to embed in our, embed in our uh, system and uh, basically uh, could, um, could obtain all of them. Uh, however, there are still some open questions. Uh, so for example, we don't have a way to address directly memory capacity because we are sim simply reducing a cost function. Okay, and also due to this, uh, the learning is implicit uh, in this reduction. Uh, so we don't have a clear learning rule. We don't know what is the mapping uh, between memories and um, synaptic weights. And finally, uh, this is a continuous rate model. So we don't have a spiking network implementation. Okay, and now I wish to thank my collaborator, my supervisor, and the funding sources that, that made this uh, project possible. Uh, thanks for your attention. Um, hello, uh, thanks for the interesting talk. And so I, um, I find that um, uh, in your object objective function, you actually regularized your uh, okay. weights, right? Actually, the last uh, year. Yes. Uh, Is, sorry. Uh, I just wonder, like, what's the purpose of that? Is that for the purpose of uh, replicating some features of uh, the no, real okay. system? Or so, so the point, uh, so this is, a, this is a balanced state, is a condition of I input, uh, uh, both excitor and inhibitory. Uh, so what we do here is actually asking the opposite. We want the weights to be small. Uh, and this is simply due to heuristic reasons, because when we initially trained the system, we saw that weights were, were very, very high. I think be because simply requesting this uh, presence of robust stability, what happens is that the weights tend to grow a lot. Uh, compared to what, what you will luckily need to, to have the rate uh, uh, in which to express the memory. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, so actually this term is just to lower the weights. Um, so you're saying that actually like regularizing these weights actually help your perf uh, system to have better performance, is that right? Um, or no, not even that. I think we did it just uh, for biological reasons to avoid an excessive growth of weights. And uh, you can see this uh, energetically. Uh, I mean, there would be no point for, for real system biological networks to have very, very high weights and not even probably biologically possible. Yeah. But with uh, those networks so. uh, with very large weights that you have trained, are they able uh, yeah, to... Yeah, we, we did not compare the performances. I would expect that the performances are better probably because this weight term penalizes the, the other terms that instead just ask for robust stability. Uh, so I would expect a better performance, but we don't have data on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, welcome. So your system, you build in the fixed attractors, but have you thought yep. of building in limit cycles or any dynamics? Uh, well, not at the moment. So the, uh, this is just a proof of concept. Um, uh, but um, so in, in principle, what we can do is uh, to train a network with um, uh, fixed, fixed point attractors, and on top of that, uh, just add uh, like a little velocities on the points so that the system starts moving around or, uh, yeah. Uh, well, but it's still something that uh, we have to do. Uh, what if you take your existing network and use a time varying input rather than a, a fixed mm -hmm. input? Uh, so, uh, well, that just tends to, mo to move around uh, all the attracting points, but then, uh, of course, at some point, I will just lose them. Um, uh, so, I mean, the problem is that it's not trained for, for this uh, variation in the input. Um, so I think, yeah, to include that, we should also keep that into account. Uh, I mean, we, we can train a fixed point for different uh, values of uh, inputs, but, uh, well, in, in that case, it will be, we did that, but it seems a trivial task because then depending on the input, the, the system has a different fixed point. Uh, so basically, the, the fixed point is given by the input you give to the network. So as if you know already what is the dynamics that you, you are recalling, uh, as opposed to giving a noise initial queue and having the system decide what is the, the best attractor. So, so Rafa uh, used to has a paper that came out recently in PNAS where he records optically from about you know 200 neurons, mm -hmm. and in vivo in in a mouse that's actually uh, sitting on a ball running, um, and he finds that there are certain he calls yeah, patterns of activity that cycle uh, mm -hmm. between these different patterns. They look a lot like you know these attractors. Uh, but interestingly, sensory input will activate the very same attractors. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it, it looks as if you might be able to replicate some of that. Yeah, okay, I mean, for now, they're, they're fixed at point. And of course, I mean, the initial queue can be also seen in terms of uh, some delta current that initializes the state. Uh, but yeah, we do not, 
uh, explore much what happens changing currents. Uh, uh, could you okay. comment on the redundancy of the system? Like suppose some connections were randomly destroyed, how would that affect the recall? Uh, okay, well, uh, I mean, that's what we did over here, right? Uh, we, so, we, okay, um, so we just try to uh, increase the sparsity of the system, so we just uh, cut the, the, like the smallest connections. Um, so I, I don't have data for, um, what, I mean, on what happen, would happen if I cut uh, randomly also high connections. Um, so I don't know, I mean, the system does not have robustness on, on, on these because it's just trained for robustness of the initial queue. So I would expect that if we, if we cut very high weights, maybe it might lose stability. Um, but I, I, did, I did not test that. Okay. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.